20 years ago, i uh, do that, 1978, I came to Minnesota, um, kind of fresh out of graduate school and a couple of years of teaching to work for Extension. Um, and I, for the next 20 years, ran around the state being a less talented version of Ben Winchester. Um, and, 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 and when I started out, I was doing what was done at the time, and that was picking the low-hanging fruit and telling the story of decline for rural places and the history of how that came to be. Um, and I, it got to be really kind of boring bringing people down, um, which I was doing an effective job of. And, and so I thought, well, this, there, what, what's the good news story in this? And began to look for other things um, and, and spent quite a bit of time doing that. Um, 1995, I moved to Nebraska. Now, most of you, if you've ever been in Nebraska, know it is Highway 80 across the state and you're bored to death. Um, let me tell you, there is more to the state than that. It's about half the size and population, a little less than, of Minnesota. We look longingly at some of what we think of as your big cities, places, oh, gee, like Faribault, <laughs> would, be, would, be, would be huge. Um, by Nebraska standards. Nebraska, of Nebraska's, uh, we have 529 incorporated communities in Nebraska, 230 of them are under 250 in population. We are very much a railroad state compared to Minnesota. That is, the reason our communities are there is not because they had a mine or because they had timber, it's because there was a railroad passing through that had to stop for water and it was picking up agricultural products. We have communities in Nebraska that are where they were because they were built in expectation of a railroad that never came. Of our 93 counties, 28 have population densities of less than six per square mile. I have a half dozen or so counties with fewer than 500 people. I have a couple that are right around 300 population. There are two counties with no incorporated community whatsoever. We are a very rural state. Um, so with that in mind, let's go back to this cohort life cycle. There are many places within the life cycle, Ben mentioned this, where individual decisions can and do in aggregate affect rural places, communities, and regions. Um, it starts with youth as people look at their community and say, gee, I'd like to go to college, I'd like to join the military. Um, and the trend that we have is pretty much a long-term trend. Um, we still see population decline, driven mostly by the uh, outmigration of the young as they go to college, join the military, um, just a thirst for adventure, or a desire to establish an individual biography, and I'm going to talk about biography just a little bit in a minute here. Um, in migration does occur, it seems to occur in the 30 to 49 age group, um, which uh, I like to think of as prime earning years, or certainly the beginning of those years. Um, and uh, it can offset, it can offset the losses of young. Um, doesn't always do it, but there are examples I can find where we've seen enough in migration of, of people in this age group to actually change, shift the trend of population loss. Um, and many of them bring children with them because 30 to 49 is about where you have that. Now, a long time ago, we used to survey people and say, what do you like about small town life? And they would say, it's a great place to raise your kids. And we would find that people who had grown up in a small town um, and had been um, in the it takes a village situation. Um, if, if you grew up in a small town, you know that if you did something wrong, which of course I never did, but if that were to happen to you, um, somebody was going to turn you in because you were, you were observed and people knew who your father was. I used to tell a story about Fred Dickensheets, who was the uh, police chief in my hometown. Um, Fred, you'd, you'd be out doing something, the, the bad kids, I'm not one. The bad kids would be out doing something on Halloween and Fred would see them do it and he would stop them and say, quit that, and being the smart ass punks that they were, not me, they would say, what are you going to do about it, Fred? And Fred would say, I'm going to tell your father. And, and that would pretty much solve it. One of the things I noticed when, we, when, I, when you look at population gain that occurs when places begin to urbanize around larger, community, larger cities um, is that the crime rate spikes. And we think, well, that's because all these, the, the moral compass is lacking for these people that moved out of the cities into our little town. It's got nothing to do with it. It's the fact that Fred no longer knows your father. And so all of a sudden, if he sees you doing the same thing you would have seen somebody else doing 20 years ago, he says, well, I have to deal with that in a different way. I have to deal with that formally. You're going to be in the system now. I can't deal with it informally um, because I don't know if it's going to work. So, so um, the, 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 these, these changes occur, and this interchange that occurs is between 
urban populations, suburban populations, and rural populations. Overall, there's a mixing of these of, of population. It's a mixing of skills. It's a mixing of age groups. And it's a mixing of experiences in such a way that everybody that makes this shift is bringing something new to the package. Um, we see that um, the, the people are bringing children age 10 to 17. Um, and we see that this uh, interchange loss or gain is necessary for an influx of new ideas, and it is necessary to cultivate social capital in the community. It also can cause the kind of disruptions I spoke of when I said that, well, it changes things like how you deal with crime, how you deal with how, how the formal system interacts with the informal system. So a gentleman in Nebraska named David Drews, who is essentially our state demographer, we don't actually have one of those, we don't, we don't have a Tom Gillespie, but we do have a state data depository library, and this is the guy that does the analysis, and what he has been able to demonstrate is that metropolitan counties in our state are net losers of people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Now, that makes sense because they're turning them out there, the universities, the colleges are in those larger communities, but they're not retaining a significant portion of the people they turn out. We're losing them out of these metropolitan areas. Now, a lot of them go to other states out of Nebraska. Nebraska is really good at, at exporting educated people to other states. Um, but we also find in the same data that smaller communities, especially communities of 2,500 to 5,000, are net gainers in people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, we see a net in migration of those folks. Mostly those are coming from other states, but a lot of that is also a redistribution within the state of Nebraska. This is something that we did in starting in 2006, and I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this because I'm going to say something about this narrative and how it's working right now. In 2006, some people from um, Economic Development Group in the Panhandle of Nebraska from the Scotts Bluff area approached a colleague of mine, Cheryl burkhart Creasel, and they said, we think that we are gaining populations that are moving out of the front range of Colorado, Denver, are moving out of the front range of Colorado and moving here. Now, this is anecdotal, but we think it's true. We, we hear enough about it. And we don't know who they are, and we don't know why they're doing it, and we'd like to know if that's true. And, and if it is true, we'd like to know if there's some way we can encourage it to continue. So Cheryl and I, being good academics, did exactly what a good academic would do. We wrote a grant proposal. And the grant, propo the grant proposal was very, very positive. We, we, we went and looked at the census data, and we said, hey, look, you know, when I look at small places over here, I see that 20% or more of the population in most of these places has come from somewhere else in the last five years. So this has to be good, right? So maybe this is, this is the answer to the depopulation of the, pan and the panhandle is, I mean, we are seriously rural out there. This, this is an answer to the depopulation of the panhandle. Maybe we could do something with this. We wrote this very positive, going to change the world grant proposal, and it was rejected. So two years later, we thought, well, let's try this again. It's still a good idea. We keep looking at the data, and the data says something's going on. So we wrote another one, and this time we labeled it the Buffalo Commons. And if you remember the poppers, the idea was that we should just depopulate the prairie and give it back to the buffalo because nobody was ever supposed to be there anyway. And, and what we did this time is we said, ah, but look, there are these tiny little pockets of success. The story Ben just told. Now we've got a half million bucks in our pocket and we can go out and do some research because that was the narrative that sold. So we went out and did some survey research and we ran a bunch of focus groups. We surveyed economic development people. We surveyed newcomers, which involved finding people who had been in the community for five years or less. Um, we surveyed community leadership. We did a batch of focus groups and we asked a really simple question, why the heck did you do this? Why did you move to this place? Um, and we asked, also, where did you come from? Now, when we asked, when we asked why you came, we go back here. When we asked why you came, they told us largely that it was a search for rural amenities. That it was that part of the population that Ben mentioned that say, I actually have a preference for the idea of living in a small town. I have a preference for that because I believe that I will not have a horrible long commute. I believe that the that the that the the environment, the natural environment, will be more accessible to me and will be better than it is in the city. I believe that my family will be safer because I believe that the crime rates are going to be lower. Um, and, and it was funny, when, when we ran focus groups for this, um, we got this one answer about that crime thing repeatedly. We said, what makes you think, if you're from Denver and you're moving to the panhandle of Nebraska, what makes you think that you will be safer in Nebraska? 
And this came unsolicited like a half dozen times. Somebody would say, well, I see unsecured bicycles at the swimming pool in the school. If there was an unsecured bicycle where I lived in Denver, it would be gone in 10 minutes. Therefore, I come, it's, it's funny how people's perceptions of these things, and they, and they apply it to greater things. And we began to learn from this. Um, they told us that they believed that they would be able to spend more time with their family. They told us they believed that the community would be friendlier and more trustworthy than their neighborhood uh, had been in a city. And they told us that they really looked forward to the idea of knowing their neighbors, of knowing who people were. Um, that's why they moved. We asked where they came from, and in Nebraska, about 50% of them came from a rural place, another rural community, and they've just moved from one rural location to another. Um, but about half of them came from metropolitan areas. Now, um, unlike the rest of the country, um, Nebraska became majority metropolitan only in 1990. It had been a long time before that for Minnesota. And for, they did not have a party, but, but and in fact, they didn't know what had happened until somebody told them. Um, but they, they became majority. So if you think about that, if you're going to draw somebody into your community, the, the probability in this country is that they're going to come from a metropolitan area. We're about 70% of us live that way. Um, so there is some nuance in this. When we asked who you are, we found that 36% of them in Nebraska had lived there previously. Um, we found that 40% of them had attained a bachelor's degree or greater, which is significantly higher than the population they were attaining. That's higher in Minnesota. Minnesota has done the same research. Um, they find about 68%. We found in Nebraska that 43% had children in the household. That's 51% of them in Minnesota. We found that they were generally leaving some kind of career or job to move to that place. They were not leaving because they were unemployed and had nowhere else to go. That was one of the theories that we hatched early on when they asked in the panhandle what was going on. And we looked at the data. We thought, well, it could just be a bunch of single mothers with nowhere else to go. We have to find that out. That's not the case. Um, we found out that they tend to be um, underemployed in their current situation in that rural place. Um, yet we found that the quality of life that they thought they were pursuing was the trump card. And the interesting nuance in this has to do with this point of origin. If you are a rural person, then theoretically all those advantages of being rural are already yours. You already know your neighbors, you already have a short commute, you already have access to the natural environment, so what would induce you to move? And the answer is a better job. But when we talk to those people who came from a metropolitan area where they didn't theoretically have those advantages, and we said, what's important to you? The job came down the list fifth or sixth for most of them. And they would tell us that actually what the job amounted to was an opportunity factor for them to do something they wanted to do anyway. So I'm not, they weren't necessarily just the pursuit of career that caused them to do this. It was the pursuit of place that caused them to do this. 70% um, um, of those in Minnesota say they're going to still be there five years from now. That's down to about 60% in Nebraska. And in fact, in the, in we do a survey every year in Nebraska called the Nebraska Rural Poll. We get to about 2,000 non-metropolitan Nebraskans, two to 3,000. And one of the questions we ask every year is, do you have any intention of moving in the next year? And it turns out that roughly 3 to 5% of people, depending on what's happening in the national economy and the local economy, will tell us, you know, I might move in the next year. So if you say, well, 20% of the population has shown up in the last five years, but 5% of the population thinks they might be willing to leave again, it comes out to be kind of a wash, right, over, the, over, a, over a decade. And, and, and so we don't really see the, 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 the fact that these newcomers come as, as sort of enhancing population growth for us. But what they are bringing with them um, is, um, uh, is a set of skills, a set of work skills and an education that is better than the population they're joining. You know, I, one of the things that has always bothered me about this, the, the, the narrative as we tell it, I've always hated the, the notion of a brain drain um, because it implies somehow that the people that don't leave are inferior to the, to the people who do. And I've hung around a lot of rural communities and I don't find a lot of morons out there. I don't find a lot of failures. I find a lot of people with, with something on the ball and with some ideas and with some passion for what they want to accomplish. So I never liked that. And I, and I worry about the brain gain. It works as a narrative to get us into the newspapers because people go, I didn't know that. But it implies the same thing. It implies somehow that the people that are showing up are somehow superior to the people there. Well, and to a certain extent, that's true. Because if you're younger, then 
another person, you're probably going to be better educated. If, uh, ben, ben can do things with a computer that I never. I grew up with punched cards and a paper and pencil. He grew up with modern computers and can do stuff, and he's very fast at it, and he's superior to me in those regards. So, so the idea, if you bring somebody younger in and they have those skills, they're going to be more productive. Being more productive is what happened to rural America in the first place. You know, farms got bigger. We go, oh, farms got bigger. Farms got way more productive. The individual can do much more as a result. Now we're going, oh, you know, um, um, we, we, we're bringing people in. It, go to a modern grain terminal. Have you ever gone to a modern grain terminal? Compare that to the one you knew when you were a kid, if you're old enough to make that comparison, that was down by the railroad tracks and Larry ran it. Larry ran it. He was good at it. They got the grain in, they got the grain out, it went on the train, off it went. But if you go to a modern grain terminal, there's people with engineering degrees in there. There are people with MBAs in there. There are people that can do things that Larry never could have done. They're more productive. And the increase in productivity enhances the quality of life and the incomes in those rural communities, even if the population is declining. And so to a certain extent, success is what has driven the change in rural America. Not failure. It's been driven by success, and it's been driven by great success. Um, okay, so we find that 77% um, of them, we find that that percentage is a little lower for young people. Those who rate the community as friendly and trusting have a higher are of a higher percentage among the newcomers. The expectation of staying related to job opportunities and security and feeling of belonging and suitable housing and opportunities to join local organizations and to participate with others, those are all important. One of the things people tell us when we survey them and say, what do you like about, well, if you were looking for a rural community, what would you look for? They say, and they honestly say this, they volunteer it, I would like to see a community with a vision for the future. I would like to see a community with a vision for the future, and I would like to participate in achieving that vision. Um, when we talk to people who say, well, I don't think I'm going to stay forever, and we say, why? They say, because the community isn't, I don't have the opportunity to participate in creating a better community. I'm, I'm, I, I don't see that happening. I expected it when I came here. Same way I expected everybody to be really friendly, because when I saw the town, they all went like this. It doesn't mean that they, it doesn't mean they were going to invite you over to barbecue immediately. It meant that we go down the street doing that because we're rural people. Um, and, and, and so there's, there's, there's sort of a, a, a misunderstanding or an, or an image or an expectation that urbanites who don't have a rural experience come to rural places with that can prove to be really problematic for them. Um, we are in this area, and Ben showed me this map the other day. I'd never seen it before, and he let me use it. This is a map uh, that was produced by the New York Times of um, the probability of social and economic mobility occurring by geography. And if you look at this, over here in the middle, um, except for uh, sort of the Indian reservations on the, on the south side of South Dakota, um, where there's, they have their own issues, um, but we look at this, and the probability of you advancing, of your children advancing economically and socially, is greatest here, in the middle of the country. This is where you want to be if you want your children to succeed, compared to, say, uh, Georgia or South Carolina. The probability is much, much lower there. Um, so, it's there, if, if, if place fails to meet their expect, oh, I don't want to do that, I just did that. Okay. There is a sweet spot, the point is, and we are it. Now here's the summary of these trends. The movement of people is consistent, it's large, and it's not all about out-migration. The rural narrative that has been so popular for so long portrays rural America as a great big funnel in which everything's pouring out the bottom. This is not true at all. Um, these mo those moving to rural areas are in their prime earning years. Um, you can call this a brain gain. I prefer to go back and look at that educational data and say, well, that actually is brain gain. I can, I can, I can make a better case for that than I can just for the fact that you're new. Um, and there are high levels of entrepreneurship and small business ownership among these people. When we did our surveys in, um, in the panhandle, we found a small but meaningful percentage of people who said, I came here to start a business. This was my idea. We find a small but meaningful percentage of the population, I'm talking 3, 4, 5% of those newcomers who said, I came here with no job at all. I came here because I like this place and now I'm going to create one somehow. This is a good thing. Um, so there's a new narrative for economic development. Um, 
the surveyed newcomers in Minnesota now this time um, reported about $6.6 million in household income in 2009-2010. This equates to an average household income of $66,000. We're a little lower than that in Nebraska for our newcomers, but not all that much. Um, new expanded or relocated businesses owned by newcomers reported spending $108,000 in, $108, in the region. The total economic impact of the surveyed newcomers in Minnesota showed business and household spending of $9.1 million, including 174 jobs and $7.2 million in labor income, including wages, salaries, and benefits. The survey wasn't random according to Ben, therefore we can't actually generalize beyond the study region, but the average newcomer in that study contributed $92,000 in economic activity to the region in 2009 and 2010. Now here's a message for my economic developer friends out here, for people who are in the business and hired by a county or a community to do that. And we surveyed economic developers back when we first started this research in 2008. One of the things they said to us is we are a little bit handicapped by our boards. They hire us and they tell us that our job is to go find a business that will create jobs, that will hire people. And if I get involved with things like housing, if I get involved with things like trying to market the community to attract newcomers, if I get involved with trying to put together newcomer groups or young professional groups or things that are going to help us retain this population and I am as a consequence spending time on something other than attracting new industry into my community, my board won't like it. And if you follow, the, if you're in the profession, if you're one of those jobs um, and you, you, you look at it, you say, you know, most of my colleagues don't last very long, two, three years. Um, I've seen communities turn them over every year for, for years on end. Um, and, and part of the reason is because it's going to not be possible for you to be terribly successful at your new job unless you are doing it completely, unless you are paying attention not just to the idea of attracting a new business but also to the idea of trying to do those things that are going to make um, that new business want to come there and be successful. Um, this is um, how we adapt in Nebraska to our declining population. This is a map of non-farm proprietorships as a percent of all jobs in Nebraska in 2010-2011 uh, years. So this would be 2010 data. This comes from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And what you are looking at here is tax filings. And the way you become a non-farm proprietor is to file a Schedule C. There are only three things you can be in terms of a job. Yeah, I've asked this question. Every time people say jobs, 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 I now ask, what the hell's a job? What is a job? What do you think a job is? Um, you can only be three things. You can be a wage and salary worker where you work for somebody else and they write you a check and they withhold your taxes and they provide benefits if you're lucky. Um, you can be one of those and that's our gold standard. That's what we want to create. We want lots of those wage and salary jobs. When we turn kids out of our colleges very often we say to them, you should go out and get a good job. Get a good job. Not you should go out and hang a shingle. Not you should go out and invent something. Not you should go out and make your own stuff. You should get a job. We're turning people out with that expectation and that is the gold standard. The other thing you can be is a farm proprietor, which is pretty self-explanatory. You got a farm. And the final thing you can be is a non-farm proprietor, which essentially means you work for yourself in some way, shape, or form. Now, in that rural poll I mentioned for years, we asked people, do you own a business? And we never got anywhere near the kind of numbers that we knew were reflected in these non-farm proprietorships. Never came close to it. And finally, it dawned on us, you don't own a business. You think you're working for somebody else because you get a check. And the thing that turned me on to that was actually my sister-in-law, who was at the time um, filling out data for the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. And she was doing medical transcription for them. She was doing it in um, a small town in Nebraska. Um, she was doing it with her computer, her chair, in her house. She was an independent contractor. But if I asked her who she worked for, she did not say I worked for myself as an independent contractor. She said I worked for the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center. No, you don't. They send you a check based on how much time you spend fulfilling your contract, but you're not working for them. You are working for yourself. So we started rewording the questions on the rural poll to try to pick those up. 
and pretty soon we came up with very different numbers, which I'll show you in a minute. But look at this for us. 51, 59%, 50% in these red counties of all of the, quote, jobs in that county are self, non-farm self-employment. Um, these are a look at non-employer firms, which is a different way to look at, at, at jobs. Non-employer firms are self-employed people, but they're a step ahead in that they're not just contracting with something, they also have a tax number and they could, call, they could hire somebody if they want to. Um, Nebraska, in 2012, had 127,000 of these non-employer firms. In the metro area, there were 71,000. Um, and in the non-metro area, 55,000. And in small town counties, counties with no town of 2,500, no town that big, we got lots of those, um, there were 9,500 of these. If we look at how that changed and how their receipts changed, in those rural areas, they didn't grow as fast as they did. The state um, saw them increase by about 2.6% um, between 2010 and 2012. Our small town counties only by 7 tenths of a percent. But their average, in, their average receipts grew faster. Um, and in fact, between 2010 and 2012, the average receipts of these non-employer non firms grew by 12.5%, twice the rate of the growth that occurred in the metropolitan area. So I think one of the things we need to do in economic development is sort of recast that narrative and think about something other than wage and salary jobs. Who are these people? Are these the entrepreneurs that we talk about now? Are these people who are, who are providing services that aren't being provided by big chains anymore? There's no longer, there is no longer a Goodyear store which will send the truck out to change the tire on your tractor in the middle of the field, but there's Bob and he's got his own little business and he'll do that for you. Is that what's changing in this? And I think we need to pay some attention to that. Um, the new economic de development narrative therefore has to be people focused at least as much at is, as it is industry and business focused. It is gonna be decentralized. Um, it is going to involve diversified occupations and industries. And it is going to take into consideration self-employment and multiple job holding because that's the reality of rural places. Um, the, new, um, the new narrative for, for, for community development has to do essentially, I think, and, and this is one that Ben and I have been working on with the leadership requirements of communities. For places that populations over 10,000, about 6% of the population will report that they have run for or accepted some kind of appointed or elected office. When we look at, 100, at places under 1,000 population, it's a quarter. Um, Minnesota gained 7.8% in population, 19.4% in, in nonprofit organizations. Nebraska gained 6.7% of in population in the last decade and increased its nonprofits by 9%. By the way, that 6.7% would be zero were it not for the birth rate of Latinos in Nebraska. The immigration of Latinos in the 1990s resulted in they're younger, so they have children. That is the entirety of that 6.7% growth for us, which is really interesting because when we survey rural Nebraskans and say, what do you think of Latinos? They say not very much. So they need to, they need to change, they need an attitude change there. Um, in Minnesota, most rural counties experienced a loss of population, yet nonprofits increased. Um, there are all kinds of changing types of involvement, social organizations, place-based organizations, historically broadly focused, agricultural base of interest. Today we find that this involves wide geographic areas, narrowly focused goals, um, diverse social interests, and it's driven by technology and social media. People today are challenged in connecting with the existing infrastructure, and Ben sort of told that story. And this is my story. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well. If you count up all the local government units that are available, uh, that, that exist in Nebraska, we got 2,659. The big state's Illinois. They got like 11,000 local government units. Some kind. But this is everything. Counties, townships, towns and cities, cemetery districts, um, fire districts. This is anything that can take your money, your extension district. Um, we do that on a total population of about 1.8 million. That gives us 675 people for every one of those. That's 48th nationally. That is, we are very small. We have very few people for the number of things that have to be run. If we throw in those nonprofits, now we're up to 13,000 of those, so that gives us 16,000 things that have to be run. If you're a registered nonprofit, you have to have bylaws, you have to have a board, somebody has to run the thing. The average number is three, right? Some are five, townships sometimes have five, six, seven people to run those, we made it three. And I said, well, what's that leave us? Well, now in Nebraska, we're down to 27.7 people 
for every leadership role that has to be filled. And if I look at the frontier counties, those 28 counties with less than six people per square mile, it's 13.3. And if I do that on a map, I have a county which has um, only six people per leadership role that must be filled. And the rural poll tells us that about half the people there won't do it. Wouldn't do it if, they, if you ask. So now you're down to three people per leadership role to run this community and run all of the things that you've created within it. And again, this, all the blue counties on this map are counties with less than 15 people per leadership role that I can count. Um, and then the same thing, Ben's done the same thing in Minnesota, you get much the same thing. What's your low number? The, what county? Um, so the new narrative for the rural development industry is update and provide leadership training. That's critical. Um, the, the, I, I, my, my, my mantra when I now run around Nebraska doing what Ben does here, um, because I'm looking at such small populations, is the number one job of leadership is to find the next leader. And, and you don't do that by calling them up and saying, join the lines. You, you do that in a much, much different way. The basic difference, and I, 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 I'm a sociologist, but the essential difference, I believe, between living in an urban area and living in a rural area is interaction with known others. When you are in a rural community, the biography of the people that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis is, in fact, available to you. Now, within that, there's a problem in that if you are in a world where everybody knows potentially everything about you, what's the best adaptation you can make? And that is to be demonstrably average. Thank you very much. And so we find that a lot of rural folks go way out of their way to do that. That's not the way you generate the next generation of leadership, is to look for the most average and conforming person you can find and say, we'd like you to run the lions. This is not the way you do this. The way you do this is by finding the, the, the people that are a little bit off that have, have a little bit different ideas, the people that don't necessarily fit right smack dab in the middle of what the community is and, and, and look to them to bring new ideas and new energy to people. Provide data, provide information, carry some statistics with you, and oh, for Pete's sake, be careful of the American Community Survey. If you are in a community, if, you are in, if you're looking at a population of less than 10,000, these data are not reliable for the most part, period. My favorite one is for a small town I was working with, women over the age of 85, zero plus or minus 100. <laughs> I got a negative 100 old women in this town. Where do I find them? You know? um, and, and, how, and how do I write a grant based on plus or minus one, zero plus or minus 100? It's going to be very difficult, yet your grant givers are going to want you to use those ACS data. The ACS data, when they're published, come with something called a confidence interval, an estimate of error. Look at it. Ask yourself how big that. Ask you if you, yourself if you can trust the data. And if people are handing you data that says it's from the American Community Survey and it does not have that margin of error published right beside the number, throw it away and go find it yourself so that you can look at that. And finally, work hard to connect communities to resources outside of the community. Ben talks about thinking regionally. We all agree.